Before I introduce our next speaker, Dr. Robert Hirsch, I just wanted to tell everybody a quick story on how I came to find Dr. Hirsch. And that has its roots, um, you know, several years ago as I started my own research on energy issues that face the world and the country. Um, after, um, you know, a stint as an active duty Air Force pilot being deployed overseas. And I rapidly came to the conclusion that, uh, you know, oil is a very, very precious uh, commodity that most people don't understand the value of. And uh, I think we've taken it for granted that it's always going to be there in sufficient quantities to meet our needs. And uh, Dr. Hirsch wrote a seminal report, um, uh, I think it was 2005, 2006, under contract with the Department of Energy. And uh, I read that report, and I thought it was the most credible um, um, evidence that I had seen. And uh, not only was it credible, but it was tempered with a risk mitigation strategy, which is always what you need when you uh, are going to deliver news that might uh, shock some people. So we're, we're very lucky to have Dr. Hirsch here with us today. I'm going to give you a brief formal biography of Dr. Hirsch. Um, currently, he is the Senior Energy Advisor at uh, MISI, a consultant in energy technology management, and recently the inventor of the Illumigen hydrogen production concept. Previously, he is a staff member at SAIC and RAND, Executive Advisor at Advanced Power Technologies, Vice President of the Electric Power Research Institute, Vice President and Manager of Research and Technical Services for Atlantic Richfield Company, Founder and CEO of APTI, Manager of Exxon Mobil's Synthetic Fuels and Research Lab, Manager of Petroleum Exploratory Research at Exxon, Assistant Administrator for the U.S. Department of Energy Research and Development Administration, responsible for renewables, fusion, geothermal, and basic research. He's also the Director of Fusion Research at the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission and ERDA. He served on advisory committees for the Department of Energy programs and, na and national laboratories and the General Accounting Office the Office of Technology Assessment, and the Gas Research Institute and in NASA. And he has 15 patents and 50 publications. So if you could uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Hirsch uh, to the University of Toledo today. Thank you very much. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for the wonderful introduction. Thank you to the hosts for uh, hosting the conference. I'm going to talk to you about peak oil peril. There's a lot here, and I'm going to cover a number of things quickly, and my purpose is to get you to think about something that's coming and something that's going to impact all of us. This is a cartoon out of the Wall Street Journal, and it indicated uh, all of the problems that uh, we're facing these days, uh, things that uh, we have to worry about, people worry about, uh, they don't have uh, Sandy on there, which of course we know is a significant uh, negative uh, recently. So we're inundated with problems and the Wall Street Journal at least included uh, peak oil as one of those potential uh, problems ahead. What is peak oil? I think the best definition is it's the point in time when world oil production goes into decline. And that will be a natural process, and there's not much we can do about it, but of course we're going to have to mitigate the problem. When that happens, we're going to have oil shortages, and some of you remember 1973 and 1979. It's going to be like that, except it's going to continue for a very long period of time. If you think about oil, and not many people do, because we kind of take it for granted, most of us got here by gasoline or diesel fuel or jet fuel. Things that we do on an everyday basis depend on oil products. If you look at construction, this building was constructed with oil products, bringing the materials in and moving the people to the site and back home uh, afterwards. You think about oil and commerce, and it's a basic, fundamental quantity that we all depend on, but because Things have been relatively regular in that area. We don't often think about it. We need to think about it uh, in the future. To frame the, uh, the problem and the situation, uh, first a couple of quotes uh, uh, from the IMF. Uh, present oil prices are causing economic problems worldwide. <coughs> I can't read it all from here, but uh, let's see. 
uh, uh, very significant uh, economists at uh, UCSD uh, talks about how are we going to continue to grow our economy when there's such a close coordinate, co correlation between oil supply, oil growth, and economic growth. And then the author uh, says that uh, we've got troubles ahead. Overview. Uh, world uh, oil supplies are, have leveled out recently. Production has uh, uh, leveled out. Oil is not a renewable uh, energy source. It's finite. At some point, it's going to go into decline, and that's what is often called peak oil. Uh, let me see what else we've got here. I brought the small one instead of the big one, too. <laughs> and I thought I'd be able to see the screen. Uh, at some point, oil the production is going to go into decline, and then we'll have shortages, and there will be long-term shortages, and prices will go up dramatically. So the $4 gasoline that uh, we uh, fret about uh, periodically, in fact, will be the good old days that we think about. We're, gonna, we're in for very significant economic uh, damage, and mitigation will not be simple, will not be easy, and will not be rapid. The topics that I'm going to talk about are indicated uh, here. Let's start with some background. One of the first things that's very important is people tend to talk about oil as energy, and indeed that's correct, but oil is a specific kind, of liquid, uh, specific kind of energy. It's liquid energy, as you all know, and that really must be differentiated from gaseous, uh, solid, uh, nuclear, hydro, and, uh, and so forth. If you think about the equipment worldwide, the equipment in your own spheres, that is built to operate on oil. It doesn't operate on wind energy or nuclear power and so forth. And a conversion, the switching over, indeed, is a major task that I'll touch upon uh, uh, later on. In thinking about how oil feels and oil in countries behaves, it's different than taking boxes out of inventory or the pantry. It's different than pouring liquid out of a jar or uh, uh, out of a bucket. If you look down here, and I think that works there, you can see that production in an oil field typically will go up, peak, and fall off over a long period of time. Or in larger oil fields, it'll reach a maximum, stay on a plateau, and then go into decline. You can't beat that. That's the way it works. You can coax a little bit more out, or you can screw it up and, uh, and not get quite as much out, but that's the way it behaves. And that's foreign to the way a lot of classic engineers and physicists have been trained. Here's a number of oil field examples. Uh, Prudhoe Bay reached a plateau, stayed up there for a little bit more than a decade, and has been declining ever since. Cantarell in uh, Mexico reached a, uh, a kind of a bumpy plateau, stayed there, and is in decline now. Smaller oil fields have had sharp peaks and then decline. That's the way it works. You've got to take that and take that as reality. If you add up all the oil fields in a country or a region, you see, for instance, the United States where we peaked in, world, in, in our oil production in 1970, which it turns out was predicted, but nobody wanted to pay attention to the prediction. And then we've been in decline ever since with bumps, and we've got a bump uh, uh, going right now with some unconventional oil. If you take a look at the European situation, their uh, oil production increased, hit a plateau, a fluctuating plateau, because these things are very irregular six years on the plateau, and then went immediately into something like a 6% decline. That's the way it works. If it works that way in oil fields, and it works that way in, in various countries, then it's going to work that way in the world. And I think there's no escaping that. The issue is when, of course. This shows uh, world oil production, total liquids, as a function of time going back to the uh, uh, mid-1990s and coming up to uh, the present time. What you see is an increase over time, and then we hit a plateau, and it's always a fluctuating plateau. There's always fluctuations involved. It's been seven years on that plateau, and the fluctuations are of the order of 6% in that case. 
something happened. Something happened by looking at oil prices. For a long period of time, we had uh, $20, somewhat uh, lower than $20 uh, oil. <coughs> and then the price of oil went up, and it spiked and dropped off due to the recession, and it's continued to, uh, to go upwards. And the reason for that is we're going after more and more expensive oil. You hear a lot of numbers, and it's important to put those numbers into perspective, and that's part of what this and the next slide will show. You hear the number 10 billion barrels, and that's clearly a very large number, but if you think about that as the amount of oil that you can get out of an oil field over many, many decades, and you look at the way oil fields have behaved, you typically find that a 10 billion barrel oil field will give you something like a million barrels a day production during the plateau period and then will tail off after that over a long period of time. A million barrels a day sounds like a lot, but it's only something of the order of 1% of world oil production. Small numbers are important also. Many of you remember uh, some uh, experience what happened in 1973 and 1979. We lost of the order of 5% of oil supply in the United States and that put us into recession. About here is 850,000, maybe uh, 900,000 barrels a day, and that is an awful lot when you look to either conserve it or replace it by something else. You've got to find it before you can produce it. That's obviously sophomoric, but uh, some people don't tend to think that way. You need to recognize the obvious. Pictures uh, here of uh, lower 48 states, United States, and the North Sea. That shows the discovery history over time, and then production built up afterwards. It's logical, of course, and then went into decline in both of those cases. Something like 30 years of difference between the peak of discoveries and the peak in production. We get a very large fraction of world oil now from giant, super giant oil fields. They're the really big ones. They call them the elephants uh, also. And this is a, a picture of oil fields, giant oil fields discovered in the world going back to the 1900s. And you see the, obviously a peak in there in the 1960s. You average over a 10 year period of time because again, there's major fluctuations involved. And we've tailed off ever since. We're still finding some, you hear about Brazil and other places, we're still finding some, but we're not finding anywhere near what it is we found before because we're basically running out of the availability of those super large oil fields. If you take that and you consider that we get something like 60% of world oil from those oil fields that are older now, and you think back to the picture I just showed you before, you see a general indication that we're headed for trouble because oil out of these giant oil fields is in fact going to tail off in terms of production. Something else that's important that a lot of people who are not technical don't always grasp, and that is a, a simple concept. Namely, we're consuming a great deal of oil every year. We're consuming a great deal. That means that you have to, if you're going to maintain that plateau which we've been on, you have to bring in that much new oil production every year just to keep the plateau flat. And that number turns out to be of the order of 5%, the order of 4 million barrels a day. So just to stay flat and make up for the amount of oil that we're using on an everyday basis, you've got to bring a lot into being. At some point, it makes sense that you're going to run out. Let's talk about timing. This is a big issue. This is uh, in the larger box, uh, a list of organization and peoples, people, very significant people that have talked about the peaking and the decline of world oil production. Significant uh, industry folks, significant geologists who have retired from the oil industry and have been deeply concerned about the problem, different groups, banks, a uh, whole variety of folks. 
And yet there are also people out there who saying, are saying, don't worry. It isn't going to happen soon. It's way off in the future. They don't deny that it will happen, but they say, don't worry about it. And one often wonders why they say that when a number of these folks and organizations clearly know better. In terms of who's winning and losing on this, the folks with lots of money and lots of influence, in fact, have calmed or tamped down this concern about peak oil. If this was just one way, if there was just one way of looking at this problem and predicting what's going to happen in the future, you and I would both be wary. But in fact, there are a number of different approaches to analyzing the problem. And these approaches, uh, plus or minus a few years, indicate uh, significant problems ahead. I won't go through the details. There's a, Hubbard was uh, the first to talk about peak oil back in 1956. Uh, uh, he worked for Shell Oil Company. He wasn't very popular in Shell Oil Company because they didn't want to think about that kind of thing. He predicted that uh, in 1970 uh, the U.S. production would, uh, would peak, and indeed it actually did. Uh, Colin Campbell, retired uh, oil geologist, has done a lot of details and published a great deal on this subject, and that's the kind of predictions that he shows. Uh, Mega Projects, a uh, fellow who uh, worked in Saudi Arabia and is now uh, in London, was editor of Petroleum Review, does calculations looking at major projects that are in existence and coming into existence, and one can cover something like a 10-year period and uh, he indicates 2011 to 2013 as a peak. A graduate student at Uppsala University, which has done some wonderful work in this particular area, and it turns out I was what's called an opponent for his doctoral thesis. What he did was to look at a range of uh, reserves in different oil fields around the world, and he came up with a series of uh, uh, potential future oil production curves, as indicated there. He really did a fine piece of work. Point being that there are a number of different approaches and they all indicate a near-term problem. Okay, mitigation. When this happens, it's going to hit and it's going to hurt and we're going to do something about it. If you think about the life cycle of vehicles or airplanes or tractors or anything that consumes liquid fuels, you have a picture that looks something like this. A large fleet exists, a number of new uh, machines come into being each year, and a number are retired and scrapped. The proportions here were automobiles in the United States before our recent uh, uh, problem. The point is that to change these vehicles, these machines over, is going to be very expensive and is going to be very time consuming. Something like 50 to 100 trillion dollars worldwide of equipment that burns oil depends on oil. Things that uh, can conceivably uh, help us can produce or save liquid fuels. Saving is clearly going to be very important. Conservation is all a, always a good thing without, uh, without question. You can do enhanced oil recovery, putting CO2 and heat into different uh, oil reservoirs and coaxing some more oil out. Uh, there's heavy oil and oil sands uh, in Alaska, in, uh, in rather in Canada, big project in oil sands. Heavy oil abounds in Venezuela. You can turn natural gas into liquids. There are projects that uh, are up and running that do that. Coal to liquids pioneered in Germany during the Second World War and uh, modern machinery in, uh, Sassol, by Sassol in uh, South Africa. And again, conservation, also rationing, so we're looking at rationing ahead also. People who tend to look on this as an energy problem think that maybe wind and nuclear and solar and other things are going to help, but the machinery that's out there in almost all cases doesn't operate with electric power. Over decades, a number of things will phase over to electric power. I don't know that uh, anybody has an electric power airplane uh, as yet. We did a study for the Department of Energy that uh, came out in 2005. 
it's a very difficult problem to analyze. The position that we took is, let's figure out what the best is that we can do. And because we're human beings, we're probably going to end up doing less than the best. So we analyzed a worldwide crash program looking at these particular technologies because they can save significantly and they can produce the kind of liquid fuels that will work in existing uh, equipment. The important point here and the thing that people tend to forget and a number of people um, think, well, we'll do more research and development and so forth. The way we're going to mitigate the problem is to deploy technologies that either save or produce. Clearly, we have to do research and development. There's a lot of research and development that can be done and uh, should be done uh, in the future. We did this analysis looking at the limiting case the best that we could conceive possibly doing. We assumed a step change at uh, t equals zero. We all know that's impossible. So there are a lot of things that suggest that this is going to take longer than what we, uh, uh, what we forecast and what we uh, calculated. We used simple terms. You don't have to think. If you read our reports then in our recent book, which is out, you don't have to worry about something hidden in a computer program someplace because everything is laid out specifically. The approximations are there. You can see what we did. You can differ with uh, things. Turns out that since we published this in 2005, there has been follow-up and nobody has suggested that we're wrong, which is kind of frightening because it would be kind of comforting if, if this was wrong. In fact, some folks, particularly at Uppsala University, again, have indicated that maybe we're not going to get that much coal to liquids and maybe that, not that much out of Canada and elsewhere. But there's an analysis there. You can look at it and you can understand it, I think, fairly quickly. If you take a look at the likely decline rate of world oil production, we're talking about something of the order of 5%. Maybe it's 4%, maybe it's 6%. It's going to be very complicated, depend on a whole variety of different uh, parameters. And you assume that the best we can do, which is this worldwide crash program, is implemented. This is the kind of situation you're talking about over a 10-year period. And the reason for that, very simply, is the decline starts ahead of your mitigation. And so the things that you're going to do to mitigate have to chase after something that's in the process of decline. Economic impacts. There's all kinds of data you can look at. The growth in world GDP has been matched by the growth in world oil production over a significant period of time. You can argue this plus or minus, but that's what the data basically says. If you uh, Take a look at, again, here we took 4% uh, decline and the mitig mitigation coming in. Uh, you, you can see that uh, uh, you've got a significant problem, one that even in this best case is going to take up the order of 20 years to reach uh, a, a, a kind of a steady state. After looking at this, looking at what people have done, looking carefully at what they've done, how they've done it. And the other thing that's important to me is try to understand the people. Are they optimists? Are they pessimists? What have they done? What's the quality of the work that they've done? Uh, we concluded that uh, we're on this plateau. We're likely to stay on that plateau for another one to four years, and then we're going to go into decline. And there will, at some point, be a public realization of that, which will be a shock. A number of you may remember what happened in 1973 and 1979 when we had those shocks. In fact, there was no problem when the shock occurred. It was us, the human beings, that had the reaction that caused all kinds of negative things uh, to happen. Uh, people say, well, we've reduced our use of oil recently because of uh, the recession that we've had. If you do the numbers, and our model is correct, and it may not be correct, a million barrels a day, a couple million barrels a day less production, if you do the numbers, and it's, it's very simple, only save you a matter of weeks in terms of the date of the decline. What happened in 73 and 79? We think that's prototypical of what's likely to happen. Certainly the economies are different today than they were back then, but we aren't. 
And in fact, a whole lot of what happened was the reactions that people like us had to what was, uh, had, uh, to what was going on. There was public shock and there was panic. People ran out to uh, top off their uh, gasoline tanks. We happen to see that kind of thing in New York and New Jersey going on right now. There were oil shortages. Again, we're seeing it today for unfortunate reasons and uh, in gas lines. Declining stock market because the outlook was very negative in terms of how things were gonna go. Unemployment went up. Companies cut back on their plans for expansion and cut back on their actual uh, activities, increasing interest rates because the price of a basic commodity in our economy uh, went up and we had uh, inflation and recession. And those two periods were short periods of shortage because the valve was there to turn it back on, turn the oil flow back on and increase oil again. And what we're talking about is a loss of the valve. When nature takes over and world production goes into decline, there is no valve for us. Stood in line in years past. Again, you see pictures like this with newer cars in uh, New York and New Jersey. It gives you some idea of, of the kind of thing that can happen. Do politicians know about this? Yes. Ex-President uh, 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 Clinton talked uh, not too long ago about uh, this situation and, cl and climate change and said that, yes, this problem is coming, it may actually be here. When he was president, there was less information available and so one could excuse him maybe from uh, seriously planning for this. The Bush administration, uh, knew about this and tried to hush it up. And the current administration, I briefed the White House, they try to, they've also done their best to uh, hush it up also. This is bad news. When somebody stands up and says, somebody credible stands up and says this is a problem, there's gonna be a lot of human panic. In other words, us is gonna be the problem. We wrote a book on this subject and the reason we wrote the book is we wanted to explain it because it's complicated. We made a number of simplifications so people that are not in the petroleum business could understand what it is we're saying. This book is out there. We also look at renewables and we look at all other energy forms. And of course, one of the things that many of you know is they all have shortcomings. And the question is, are you gonna keep hoping for the very best or are you gonna deal with things that have shortcomings? And that's a problem we all have to face. So in summary, situation is as indicated here. It's a finite resource. At some point it's going to go into decline and that is inevitable. The honest point here is there are people that differ on the date when the decline will begin. As I said, we think of the order of a matter of years. The oil companies, uh, the folks that are tending to tamp this problem down think it's a decade or two decades. But when you consider the size of the problem, you want to start as early as possible. There's going to be significant economic damage, and it's going to damage all of us as individuals. I've done a number of things personally. One of the things we did in the, in the book is to take, in the second to last chapter, describe what each of you as individuals can do to protect yourself to this problem, or against this problem and also to begin to look for opportunities because whenever there are serious problems, there are also opportunities. Deployment is the key to mitigation. Research and development is fine and needs to be done, of course, but you're gonna have to deploy significant things over a period of time. As I say, minimize, my suggestion is minimize your own, take this problem seriously and take a look at your own situation, your own investments, your job situation and so forth and minimize your own vulnerabilities and then look for opportunities. And the reason for that uh, uh, turnaround there is because even though this may not sound optimistic, I consider myself basically an optimist and we will get through this over a significant period of time and we'll probably be stronger for it. Thank you. Well, we want to thank Dr. Hirsch for that uh, very poignant message. Um, let's see. I wanted to advance this.
Yeah, there's there's a yeah cartoon there. A good friend of mine is a cartoonist named John McPherson who writes a column uh, or draws a cartoon called Close to Home. And uh, we had uh, John do us a cartoon that we could uh, present to Dr. Hirsch here today. You know, the top panel is, um, you know, somebody reading Dr. Hirsch's book um, uh, today. And then there's two alternate futures. And uh, I don't think Dr. Hirsch gets any, any credit in either of the futures because one is bad. And then the other one, people don't even know what happened. So, um, you know, and for those of you who want to look up the, the uh, the Greek mythology associated with Cass Cassandra. Cassandra was uh, given the gift of prophecy, but the curse that nobody would listen. So um, <laughs> yeah. we thought it we thought it was appropriate for the uh, for the occasion. So Dr. Hirsch will mail that back to you. But uh, thank you, thank you Appreciate so much. Yeah, I can yeah. put that back thank here you. for you. Sure.